Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear students. Welcome to my class. This is lecture number 6. In this lecture, we will be discussing Robert Clive, who had played a key role in the establishment of British administration in India. Let us start with his early career. He was born in England in 1725. His father was a clergyman. He started his career as a clerk at the young age of 19. But it did not satisfy him. He left this job and sailed to India in 1744. Once he reached India, he joined the service of the English East India Company as a clerk. But later, he left the job of clerk and joined as a ordinary soldier to the service of the English East India Company. From a low position of soldier, he slowly rose to the position of army commander. His rise to power we have seen in one of the lectures his first example of military talent was demonstrated during the time of the Second Carnatic War. While Chanda Sahib besieged Trichinapalli, where Muhammad Ali was housed at Robert Clive proposed to send an army to Arcot, it was the capital of Chanda Sahib, to divert the attention of Chanda Sahib from Trishinapalli. The cart was well played, no doubt. Chanda Sahib was sent a force to save his capital Arcot when it was attacked by Robert Clive in 1751. The British force consisted only a less number of soldiers. It was estimated at 200 Europeans and 300 Indian soldiers. But Chandasagi with a large force compared to British forces, could not win over Robert Clive. Chanda Sahib failed to take our court, even though he had at his disposal a large army of 4,000 soldiers, which he had diverted from Trichinapalli to our court. On his failure, to get back our coach, he was forced to surrender before the British. During one of the critical periods of the English, the intervention of the Robert Clive saved the Britishers. Otherwise, had they been failed, their fate would not have been different. He saved the prestige and honor of the British. It was the first military victory of Robert Clive. His second military victory was related to the attack of Fort William by Siraj Taula. As you have seen one of the previous lectures, despite repeated requests, the English 
resorted to strengthen the fortification of Fort William. So, the Nawab of Bengal, Siraj Daula, decided to attack Fort William. He started the besieging of Fort William on 15 June 1756. The Fort William, it was the center of activity of the British in Bengal. Suraj Dawla decided to capture Fort William because despite repeated warnings, the British engaged in the fort, strengthening of the fortification of Fort William as well as engaging in misuse of Dustaga or duty free pass. These were the reasons why Suraj Dawla decided to attack Fort William. After a show of resistance spanning five days, Fort William was capitulated by Siraj Daula. Roger Drake, he was the governor of Fort William during this time, and other important officials escaped from Fort William through the back door down the river Googly. After the capture of Fort William, Suraj Daula placed Fort William in the charge of Manikchand. He was an officer of Nabab Suraj Daula, after which Suraj Daula returned to Murshidabad, his capital. But during this time, Robert Clive came forward to save the English occupation in Bengal. Robert Clive dashed to Calcutta with a strong contingent of force from Madras. Once he reached Calcutta, he bribed Manik Chand, under whose custody Fort William was placed by Siraj Daula. After bribing Manik Chand, Robert Clive got back Fort William from the Nawab. In February 1757, Nawab Siraj Daula made peace with Robert Clive through the Treaty of Ali Nagar. Again, one, during one of the critical periods of the British, Robert Clive came forward to protect British settlements in Bengal. In addition to that, Clive also emerged victorious in getting back the former trade privileges as well as the right to fortify Calcutta which had earlier been stubbornly opposed by Nabab Siraj Daula. Not only Siraj Daula, but former Nabobs of Bengal, starting from Mushrit Kuli Khan and Alivardi Khan, all these Nabobs opposed the misuse of duty-free pass or Dastaga as well as the fortification. But now, through the Treaty of Ali Nagar, the British was able to get their trade privileges as well as the right to fortify Calcutta because of the timely intervention of Robert Clive. His next military expedition was towards Chandranagar. What was the importance of Chandranagar? It was the principal seat of the French in Bengal. In addition to their settlements in other different parts of the country, particularly at Pondicherry in South India, Chandranagar was the main French settlement in Bengal. It was also center through which the French and the Nawab of Bengal 
engaging in intrigues and counter intrigues robert clive considered it as a great threat to the british interest in bengal so chandranagar was it to be capitulated so clive attacked and captured chandranagar in march 1757 and he prevented a possible alliance between the nawab of bengal and the french against the british interest now coming to conspiracy of robert clive he considered that suraj dawla was a great threat to the british interest in bengal so he decided to replace suraj dawla by a suitable person for which he entered into a conspiracy with mirza afar he was none other than the commander in chief of the army of the nawab mirza afar was looking for to become the next nawab of bengal it brought the british and mirza afar in a same camp in addition to mirza afar there were more conspirators who were they they were rai durlab jagat seth he was an influential banker belonging to a bank house and omit chand he was an intermediary they hatched a conspiracy under which it was agreed to make mirza afar as the next nawab mirza afar in return agreed to compensate the losses suffered by the british earlier due to the attack of suraj daula the plan was well conceived and played the forces of nawab suraj daula and the english met at the historic battlefield of plassey on 23 june 1757 the nawab's army was led by none other than mirza afar the conspirator mirza afar told nawab to go back to murshidabad after the return of nawab to murshidabad the combined armies of the english and mirza afar defeated a small army of the french there only mirmudan and mohanlal of the nawab's army bravely fought and they had maintained their loyalty till last plassey was only a mere battle in name the victory was defeated even before the actual war was fought mirza afar returned to murshidabad and proclaimed as the next nawab of bengal suraj daula was killed by miran the son of mirza afar and mirza afar was declared as the nawab it was due to the timely intervention of robert clive the british was able to establish their authority in bengal with the battle of plassey the british got a political power in bengal it had importance with regard to the british now the british got the vast resources bengal was one of the richest provinces during this time it brought immense wealth of bengal at the disposal of the british immediately after the battle of plassey 
the company sent 8 lakh British pound in silver coins to Britain. Most of this money came from none other than Bengal. In addition to that, the political power in Bengal and its past resources helped the British to their military operations in Deccan and other places of India. Then with the success of the Battle of Plassey, the British began to monopolize trade and commerce in Bengal. As you have been told earlier, the French were defeated in 1757 on the sidelines of Battle of Plassey. The French had never been recovered. The Dutch was also completely defeated in 1759 at Badaira. Now we are looking at the first governorship of Robert Clive. With the success in Battle of Plassey, Robert Clive was appointed as the governor of Calcutta in 1757. His access in Battle of immortalized his name in home. He became the governor in 1757. He remained to the post of governor for three years from 1757 to 1760. Now we are going to see the major developments during this period spanning between 1757 and 1760 during the first period of the governorship of Robert Clive. What were the major developments during the period of the Robert Clive as the governor of Bengal spanning between 1757 and 1760? In 1757, Shah Alam II, who was Shah Alam II, he was the Mughal emperor, Mughal ruler. Mughal ruler Shah Alam II, along with Shuja Uddawla, Shuja Uddawla was the Nawab of Aud, they invaded Bihar. The combined armies of Shah Alam II, the Mughal ruler, and Shuja Uddawla, the Nawab of Aud, attacked Bihar. But Clive was able to easily defeat them and they were forced to return to their own territories. It pleased Mirjafar. In return, Mirjafar granted a Jahir. subscribing an annual income of 30,000 British pounds. This Jagir was granted to Robert Clive by Mirjafar. The next major development was defeat of the Dutch at Chinsura in 1759. Mirjafar was tired of British because constantly the English demanded wealth on the slightest pretext. It was because of the demands, excess demands made by the British. Murjafar decided to rid of English from Bengal, following which he entered into a conspiracy with the Dutch whose place of operation was at Chinsura. But Robert Clive did not allow this. He attacked the Dutch and defeated them in 1759 at Bedaira. 
the dutch was also never recovered from their defeat now the field was open exclusively for the english earlier they had defeated the french in 1757 in 1759 they defeated the dutch next military expedition of robert clive was none other than capture of northern circards you may recall that the french soldier come diplomat bussy he was stationed at hyderabad he was recalled by count d daly during the period of the third carnatic war it is the south it provided an opportunity to capture northern circards since it was unprotected by the french it was a mistake committed by count d daly during the period of the third carnatic war otherwise the hyderabad would remain one of the prominent centers of influence of the french but because of the calling back of buzi gave an opportunity to the english to establish themselves in hyderabad robert clive sent an expedition to hyderabad in the absence of the french soldier come diplomat buzi captain ford easily captured northern circards with this the influence of the french came to an end in hyderabad it was during the period of the governorship of robert clive spanning between 1757 1760 he greatly consolidated british power in bengal as well as in dakkan in 1760 he fell ill and he returned to england he was honorably received at britain and he was awarded the title lord as well as created a peer in the upper house of the parliament that is house of lords now we are going to see the second governorship of clive in bengal after the departure of robert clive vanistar became the governor of bengal he remained to this post for a period of 5 years from 70 60 to 1765 what he was a transcendent failure in checking the prevailing abuses he created it was during this period chaos and confusion prevailed everywhere during this period the company officials began to amass huge wealth through fair and foul means the company officials engaged in private trade and forced the forced the merchants to sell the commodities at low prices the company officials also began to accept illegal presents and in addition to all these the dustaka or duty free pass began to be sold by these officials of the english east india company to indian merchants for a return of heavy price because of this the british the administration in bengal got crippled it was in this background the english east india company decided to bring back 
Robert Clive again as the governor of Bengal. He reached it in 1765 after he became the governor for the second time he continued this post till 1767 this period from 1765 to 1767 was the period of the second governorship the period of the second governorship of robert clive what were the major developments of the second governorship of robert clive we are looking into it before which we have it to recap that in 1764 through the battle of bexar the combined armies of mir qasim shujaud daula and shah alam second were defeated by the british the battle of plassey during the period of robert clive was a conspiracy while on the other hand the battle of bexar in which three forces three indian forces were defeated by the british it demonstrated the military superiority of the british the three forces were shujaw daula of the nawab of out shah alam second the mughal ruler shah alam second the mughal ruler and the nawab of bengal mir qasim shuja shuja was the nawab of out shuja ud daula these three combined armies were defeated by the british in the battle of bexar in 1764 so a settlement with these defeated forces were long overdue once clive landed in india his first attention was to make a settlement with these defeated forces he first met shuja ud daula the nawab of out who had earlier been defeated at the battle of bexar by the british he concluded with with him the treaty of allahabad on 16 august 1765 robert clive concluded the treaty of allahabad with shuja ud daula the nawab of out what were the terms of the treaty of allahabad one to surrender allahabad and kora to shah alam second he was the mughal emperor the second term was pay 50 lakh indian rupees as a war indemnity to the british thirdly he was required to confirm the zamindar of banaras belwan singh in full possession of his estate these were the three terms of the treaty of alagabad entered into between robert clive and shuja ud daula the nawab of out once robert clive landed in india both of them also agreed to render military assistance according to the exigencies of time and circumstances another treaty it came in on a second treaty of alagabad it was also signed in the same time august 1765 this was the second treaty of alagabad it was signed between shah alam second the mughal emperor and robert clive 
what were the terms of the treaty of second treaty of Allahabad? Shah Alam second granted the Diwani. Diwani means the right to collect the tax. It was granted by Shah Alam second to the British the right to collect the revenue of Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. This right was granted by Shah Alam second to the English. This right was given to the English. The English agreed in return to give Shah Alam second a subsidy of 26 lakh rupees per annum and the two districts of Korea and Allahabad from Shujaud Dawla, the Nawab of Out. In addition to that, Shah Alam would reside at the Alagabad fort as a virtual prisoner of the British for six years. These were the terms of the treaty ended in between Robert Clive and Shah Alam II, the Mughal Emperor. Dual system of government in Bengal. The system of government was introduced in Bengal by Robert Clive in 1765. Once he settled with Shujaud Dawla, the Nawab of Auth, and Shah Alam II, the Mughal Emperor, his next attention was creating a better and efficient administrative system in Bengal. He find it in the introduction of the dual system of government in Bengal. The system of government was introduced in 1765 in Bengal. What were the features of the dual system of government? We are going to see these features. Under this system, the Diwani and Nizamat functions got divided into two. Diwani means collection of land revenue. Nizamat means administration of criminal and civil justice, land order. All these come under Nisamat functions. Diwani means collection of land revenue. It was during the period of the Mughals. These functions got divided into two. Nisamat functions were rendered by Subedar during the period of the Mughals. Subedar. He was in charge of the general administration, administration of civil and criminal laws. Divan, provincial divan, it was during the period of the Mughals, provincial divan was engaged only in the collection of revenue. Following this, Robert Clive divided the functions of the state into two watertight compartments, one Diwani functions and the second one Nisamat functions. The Nawab continued to handle criminal, civil, police administration for which the Nawab would be given 53 lakh rupees annually. The English East India Company would have military power and they would collect land revenue and other revenues of the Bengal. This arrangement came in known as dual government because of the rule of two. Who were the two rulers? One, the rule of English East India Company with whom all the powers were vested. Second, the Nawab. But this system of government 
introduced in Bengal came into known as dual system of government in Bengal. Bengal had now two masters who were the Nabab and the company. Civil administration, maintenance of land order, all these were the duties of the Nabab. The company took the charge of the collection of land revenue. The Nabab Nabab was overburdened with the responsibility of administration, but he did not have any revenue other than the annual payment made by the British to the tune of fifty three lakh rupees. Even though. The Diwani rights were got by the British. They appointed the Indian officials for the collection of revenue. The British did not engage in the collection of revenue. Instead of which, they appointed revenue officers, mostly semi-intars, were appointed for the collection of revenue. The English East India Company appointed two deputy divans. These divans were appointed by the British. These divans were Indians, not the British officials. Duty of divan was to collect the land tax for the British. One Muhammad Rasa Khan. Muhammad Rasa Khan was appointed by the British for the collection of revenue from Bengal. land tax customs taxes all these were collected by the deputy divan in bihar another deputy divan was appointed by the british for the collection of revenue it was raja shida proy muhammad rasa khan was also acted as deputy nasim that is nisamat functions maintenance of land order administration of civil and criminal justice come under nisamat functions muhammad raza khan also acted as the deputy diwan of bengal as you have been told earlier even though the british got the divani rights in bengal bihar and orissa this actual collection of revenue were made by the indians appointed and removed by the british however with whom did this actual power vest it was with the english east india company with whom the actual power vest why did robert clive introduce the dual system of government having two masters at a time one the nabab second the english east india company for the administration of a same province of bengal he himself made following observations why he introduced dual system of government in bengal first if the british captured the power directly he feared that indian princes would unite indian princes would unite against the company secondly he feared that he was doubtful that whether the dutch and the french would hand over their duties on trade or whether they would acknowledge the subedarship of the english in bengal these were the doubts of the robert clive thirdly the company did not have any trained official to run 
the administration of Bengal. Robert Clive wrote three times to the court of directors, but there was no reply from the court of directors about the appointment of the trained British officials for running the administration of Bengal. The court of directors were against the acquisition of territories affecting trade and profit. The court of directors was mainly interested only in commerce and finance rather than territorial acquisitions. Then had the British directly acquired power in Bengal, Robert Clive strongly feel that it would move British Parliament to interfere the affairs of the English East India Company. It was because of these reasons Robert Clive decided to introduce the dual system of government in Bengal. Now we are going to make a look at how this dual system of government function in Bengal. No doubt the dual system of government that is the compartmentalization of the functions of a government ended in transcendent failure leading to the complete breakdown of administration. The company with it all the powers were concentrated but it had no responsibility, it was not responsible. Nava was responsible, he was responsible for the maintenance of land order, but he did not have the adequate power for it. The responsibility and the power should be commensurate with each other. The Nawab had the responsibility, but he was powerless, even though he was required to maintain land order. While the, all the powers were vested in the hands of the British, but they were not responsible. Neither the servants of the company nor the Nawab was nor the Nawab about the duties of each chaos and confusion ruled Bengal. Both the servants of the company and the Nawab exploited the people. Both of them engaged in getting money from the people. The revenue collectors The British did not directly collect revenue from Bengal. They entrusted the duty of the collection of revenue to the Semintars. The Semintars collected over and above what the British had prescribed. For example, if the British prescribed the tax at 100, the semindars used to collect 200 or more. Since the tax was high, coercive measures were employed by the semindars for the collection of revenue, especially from the peasants. Then, what was the net result? of the exploitation of the peasantry, 
the peasants were not left money even for the purchase of seeds or agricultural implements all these monies were taken away by the semintars and it was because of the oppressive taxation system the peasants declined from the cultivation everywhere the country began to be filled with thieves there was nobody to maintain land order even though nizamat functions were vested with the nawab he did not have the sufficient resources for the maintenance of land order because of thieves the trade and commerce got adversely affected the thieves flourished across bengal affecting trade and commerce adversely bribery and corruption became the order of the day this was brought into bengal by the english the natives followed the suit everything was decided by money the servants of the company who had come here only to take money home they were not interested in the welfare of the people of bengal they used fair and foul methods for getting money they used to engage in private trade and selling these products in europe amassed huge profit more administrative reforms we are going to look at these administrative reforms introduced by robert clive it was rampant the company officials who were engaged in official trade and amassed huge profit by using the staga or duty free pass actually in 1717 this dastaga or duty free pass was granted by mughal ruler farooq siyar only to the english east india company not to the officials but the english officials began to use this dastaga or duty free pass by purchasing commodities from bengal without paying tax after purchasing these commodities without paying tax these items were sent to britain where they sold it at a high price the difference between the purchasing power and the selling price was the profit of these english officials and they also used to accept gifts in order to prevent these practices that is engaging of the british officials in private trade and in order to prevent the acceptance of presents he started a society of trade in 1765 the society of trade would control the internal trade means the trade won tobacco and salt the society of trade used to monopolize trade on salt and tobacco in addition to betel nut betel nut was also monopolized by the society of trade 
created by Robert Clive in 1765. Under this arrangement, the Society of Trade would purchase tobacco, salt and betel nut and sold it to the retailers. The Society of Trade got profit, immense profit from the purchase of these commodities and is further sell with the retailers with whom did this profit go? It was shared among the superior servants of the English East India Company. Governor Robert Clive, he was to receive 1 lakh 75,000 pounds per annum. This was the profit shared among the superior officers of the English East India Company. A colonel in the army would receive 7,000 British pounds annually from the profits of the Society of Trade, which monopolized trade in certain commodities, commodities such as betel nut, salt and tobacco. A major would receive 2,000 pounds annually. No doubt, the Society of Trade only further worsened the situation. It was considered as a mechanism to earn profits by Robert Clive and other officials of the English East India Company. Over and again, with the creation of the Society of Trade, the engagement of the officials of the English East India Company in private trade did not last long. It flourished as before. Following which, Robert Clive was forced to abolish the Society of Trade in 1767. Now, coming to the military reforms introduced by Robert Clive in Bengal. What were the major military reforms Robert Clive introduced in Bengal? First, the allowance of the Bengal army officials was twice as high of their corresponding officers in Madras army. The batta or the special allowance of the Bengal army officials was double than their counterparts in Madras army. This military officers in Bengal considered this batta as the part of their salary. Robert Clive he discontinued this practice on 1st January 1766. From now onwards, the special elements or batta was given only those army officials who were required to work outside the frontiers of Bengal and Bihar. It created White Muttuni. The army officers in Bengal submitted resignations to Robert Clive in order to register their protest against the discontinuation of the special allowance granted to these army officers in Bengal. He was not relented. He accepted these resignations and ordered the trial of officers who had submitted resignations. In order to find a substitute 
for these army officials he called available troops from madras and even promoted non commissioned officers to commissioned ranks of lieutenant colonel captain etc robert clive was able to suppress white mutiny with effective hand in 1767 robert clive sailed for england but during this time he was received with mixed feelings he was prosecuted for corruption and abusing his powers especially his creation a society of trade was full of corruption however he was acquitted by the court considering the great and meritorious service to his country following which he was he committed suicide in 1774 questions what were the terms of the treaty of alagabad what do you mean by the dual system of government in bengal comment on robert clive was the real founder of the british in india thank you dear students for watching my class thank you Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude immoral vulgar and senseless george bernard shaw absolutely loathed shakespeare as he did homer but perhaps no other criticism about shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller provided someone has told him the story earlier now this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true none of shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever they are all written using pre-existing materials pre-existing stories now does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist well i'll leave that for you to decide see you in the next episode of literary snippets